How you doing? Well done. Let's see, I've only got fit there, haven't I? Huh? I've only got fit there, haven't I? Yeah. Right. Some of your mates are in trouble, aren't they? Yeah. Can you tell me anything about it? Well, I think McDonald's got nicked. Thing, you know, don't mind helping out, but I've got a glass amongst them. The nice start steaming in and doing yeah, that. Yeah, that's right, yeah. To get them all out, they need to slightly the grass meat, isn't he? Like, if, if you nicked anywhere in London, yeah, right, right. Uh, I can get on the blow to someone who will know someone, 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 someone yeah, yeah. who can get something done. This is in London, because we've got more yeah. villains than our game and you've got in yours, you know. <laughs> <laughs> got more yeah. villains than our game and you've got in yours, you know. of the 1970s, London was a city under threat. Vice and sex has taken over. Anybody connected with drugs should be put away for a long time. Drugs, pornography and violent robbery were front page news. They stepped out of a black limousine, all four with stocking masks. Three, Toynbee Street, E1. But behind the headlines lay a sinister, hidden truth. People would tell me stories about taking a drink. The drink was a brown envelope. Could I be guilty of something I didn't do? I could not believe it. Amongst honest officers, a secret network of bent coppers operated across London. But I took it the money. I could assume that 10 other people were also bent. It's the story of corruption that went to the very top. We didn't need gangsters, you know, we, we had uh, policemen. And the band of honest coppers who took on the fight to stop the rot. A10 branch. This new anti-corruption department, A10, put fear into the heart of the many corrupt CID detectives. A bent detective is himself a wrongdoer. He harms the whole fabric of public confidence in the police. And he can look to no mercy at all from me. Oh, CID, please. CID. Good Detective Sergeant Simons, please, if he's in. Yeah, hold on. Speaking. Hello, is um, Perry, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to see you about, you know. Yeah, where are you now? Well, I'm at Willage you now, you see. Willage? Right? Yeah. I'll see you tonight. It's October 1969, and petty South London villain Michael Perry tips off the Times newspaper, claiming he's being extorted for money. Not by other criminals, but by a detective in the Metropolitan Police. How you doing? Well done. To get to the truth, the Times conceal a recording device in Michael Perry's car, as he secretly meets Detective Sergeant John Simons. I'm sorry, I'm only got fit there, I'm only got fit there. Detective John Simons was highly respected. He had been an officer in the Royal Artillery. And here he was taking money from a villain. He was saying, you pay me money and I'm your insurance policy. I will look after you. You want to move out that? Oh, move, man. About a month ago, I live here. I wonder that you were having gear in there over the weekends, eh? Yeah, what, drink, what, up uh, spank gear, yeah, 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 yeah. See, which was another silly thing to do. All you want is a little lock-up Gary somewhere, isn't it? Yeah, oh, yeah. Moody name. <laughs> All you want is a little lock-up Gary somewhere, isn't it? Yeah, oh, yeah. Moody name. 
John Simons is wanting to control him and control his money and what he can do. Michael Parry is beginning to feel really nervous because he realizes that this is all going to go really wrong at some point and he wants out. And he thinks well, the only thing I can really do is go to the press. The public would have been absolutely shocked if they knew what was going on. Policemen? Corrupt? I just don't believe it. Why would they be corrupt? I think they do a very difficult job very well. Well, I think they're always ready to sort of rush out and help. Who am I going to handcuff? <laughs> Keeping law and order in late 1960s London takes more than 20,000 officers from the city, the transport and the Metropolitan Police. The police were respected and revered and they epitomised trust and honesty and kindness. Police officers and detectives go to work to do the very best thing that they can do and to serve the public. That's the ethos and that's what I witnessed most of the time. In the 60s and 70s, this sort of image of a friendly organisation was of course a myth. The more people believed the myth, the more the corrupt police officers could exploit that myth for their own benefit. Unfortunately, when you've got Ben Cobbs, no one is safe. At the age of 17, I had a car, I had Rovers, Jaguars, and I was constantly getting stopped by the police. In London at this time, the police have the right to stop and search anyone they think is acting suspiciously. Who's stopped and how often is left unchecked and unrecorded. There's three of us in the car. The car had come past and then three people got out of the car. I knew it was police. I didn't give it a thought that we was in trouble in any way. And then two seconds later, a uniform police come around the corner. And with that, my head was pushed onto the roof of the car. Police officer, he said, you are under arrest for the theft of Royal Mail bags. We was all looking at each other, you know, what's going on here. We were driven to a police station. There were various bits on his table. Police officer picked up a silver trophy and then he threw this trophy at me, but it hit me on the chest and then it just fell on the floor. And then all of a sudden he just went, well, pick it up then. And as I went down to pick it up, I thought, why had his mood changed? That was just the way he said it. If he just said, oh, can you pass it over? I'd have picked it up. And I thought, this ain't right. And I said to him, I'm not picking it up. And I kicked it over to him. And he just said to me, very clever, which I believe now, he was trying to get my fingerprints. And then the penny starts to drop slowly. This ain't right. We're being fitted up or something. Fitting up was to plant some kind of evidence often with the fingerprints on it or something that inevitably tied the individual to the item that they shouldn't have had in order to secure a conviction. We are talking about a rogue minority. That was the way corrupt police officers in parts of London operated. 
people's lives are ruined. As the Times investigation builds momentum, covert recordings reveal Michael Perry is now being targeted by two other Metropolitan Police detectives. Uh, can I speak to Inspector Robson, please? C9, I think it is. C9. Uh, can I speak to Inspector Robson, please? There's nothing at the moment. Oh, but Sergeant Harris, is he back? No, who's that? This is, well, I was supposed to give him a phone call today, you see. Uh, what's your name? Uh, well, um, it doesn't matter, I'll give him a ring later on, eh? All right. All right. My name. Right Michael Perry was a petty South London villain. He was a suspect, a face, and it occurred to a couple of Metropolitan Police detectives, Robson and Harris, that he might be either a source of information or a source of money. They went to his flat. They saw certain bits and pieces which, if gelignite was added, could have been useful for safe blowing. One of the officers says to him, oh, a bit of gelignite would go nicely with this. Lo and behold, in due course, they forced him to put his hand on a stick of some soft substance, which he then believed was gelignite. And then, of course, they had him. With his fingerprints on it, they could use this as a weapon against him so that either he would pay bribe money or he would act as an informant against other criminals in the South London fraternity. So they won both ways. Two hours after Michael Perry calls Scotland Yard, Detective Sergeant Gordon Harris rings back. Who's that? Gordon. Gordon. Yeah. Did you, you just rung me, hadn't you? What's the matter? Uh, well, I, I want to see him about, say, about the, um, we saw something happened to me yeah. and the, the jelly, like. Yeah, yeah. I wonder whether I could, um, you know, get out of it. being fitted up with gelignite put the fear of God into him. Perry was doomed from that moment on. If you talk to people in, say, the inner city areas, particularly in London, they all knew what the arrangement was. They knew that it was very unwise to take on the police. If, the, if you got your collar felt, even if you were being fitted up, you had to take it on the chin. There was no point trying to tell the wider public or anybody else, because all that would do would make your grief even greater. it then starts to encompass honest people. And suddenly they find themselves uh, facing a judge and jury on the basis of faked evidence. Two months after his wrongful arrest for mailbag theft, Stephen Simmons is briefed by his solicitor. You come in, Brady. My solicitor, is she right? Tell us what happened. I said, we'd been in the castle pub and I was going off to the snooker hall. The solicitor said, um, read this. It was the charge sheet, which we'd never seen. Fox Sierra from 170 Now saying that they see us on a train robbing it, taking 13 Royal Mail bags, and I'd seen the police and shouted out, it's the police run. And then they chased us through the train yard and we got into the car and drove off. It was just liars from start 
to finish. The solicitor said, right, you're going to stand up and call police officers liars. If that's what you're going to go to court with, what I can say is you will definitely go to prison. Stephen Simmons pleads not guilty, but on the evidence of a corrupt detective, he's sentenced to eight months. I told my parents, and I said I didn't do it. And my father went, well, why would a police officer lie? Without a shadow of a doubt, I let my parents down. I can't tell you how much damage that has done to me. It's just what I've done to be parents, which I can never turn back, no matter what happens. Because they're dead. So, yeah, that was, that's been the hard part, and that will go to me to the day I die. It will take 42 years for Stephen Simmons' conviction to be overturned and for his name to be cleared. Corrupt police officers thought they could do what they wanted. They knew that they could invent confessions from people they were used to dealing with, working class people who had no uh, political muscle, if you like. hard-drinking and aggressive section of the public has always given the coppers a tough time. Between the police and sections of the working-class population, there exists almost a state of war. By the nature of his job, the copper is conservative and establishment-minded. In the class war, he's firmly one of them. It's a police car and you're going in the police car. What? Just behave yourself, because you're told. I was not Pack. doing anything. That's the way life was. There was a certain balance there. They, they took a liberty then they could expect retribution. In London, most of the criminals that you came up against um, were going to be drawn from the society that you were dealing with. Most of them were working class and the police had the power. And therefore, if you were the corrupt police officer, they were an easy target. Pardon. I do, the Times continued to record Michael Perry's conversations. Despite paying Robson and Harris to be free of the Jellignite threat, he hasn't escaped their control. I've got this fucking man in the yard on me all the time. What's his name? Oh, Robson. John Simons, the other copper extorting him for money, offers advice on how to deal with the two Scotland Yard officers. He takes another 50 pounds. Robson, yeah. what does he want then? I just want to make a meeting this afternoon. I'll give him the money before, but who he wants? Well, what could he want you for if you've done the business? So you have, he, there's no. nothing owing, is there? No, he had he, he's got nothing on you. But as I say, if, if you've paid all your day, all it can be is a tip off about um, something else. We're going to try and blag you for some more money because Christmas is coming. <laughs> <laughs> Perry was like a stick of rock being eaten from both ends at the same time. These detectives are leeching off him and there was nothing he could do about it. Well, I've heard you doing well anyway, so I can keep that up. The other thing you want to do is go it away, see? I'd say, like, a lot of blokes I know that have known over the years, they can do it all on crumpet and they can booze and gambling and that. But well, if you can poke it away and put some premium on you, see? Later on, get a little shop or yeah. something. John Simons is laying out a complete career program. You know, it's like a teacher at school or a tutor at university. He is telling Michael Perry how his entire career as a criminal can be secured. He could basically make a permanent living out of this. You could put a bird in there running it, a little switch up or something. Oh, and then the wheel comes off, so what? You've got a home and a fucking business. 
I mean, it's very avuncular, you know. You imagine him patting him on the head at the same time. But it's a policeman telling a person how to run their criminal career. It is really remarkable. So, the thing is this, you said, like, doing our sort of thing, you've got, there's got to be a certain amount of trust. Yeah, and mate. the day that one of us fucks the other one, bang, that's it, you know. <laughs> bang, that's it, you know. In terms of relationships between criminals and police officers, it's not equal, is it? Because you've got the law on your side. If you are corrupt, whether that's greed or it's by your ego, it's about power and how power, you know, can corrupt. The word corruption is used around policing across a wide range of activities. One of the things that wouldn't have been included in a definition of corruption was racism, and it was endemic. You have to remember that the police were white male heterosexual, and they recruited white male heterosexual. There were very few black officers. You can have your own beliefs and then when you join the police, it is about wanting to belong and you hear other people talking in a negative way. And what happens, I think, is that we internalise the organisation's discourse. That becomes the norm. Referring to black wolf to racial stereotypes was commonplace in those days. The N-word, Sambo, Coon, Rastus, a very simplistic colonial view of where you came from and who you were. We do not like to be called Coon because we, do, we, don't, we don't like the attitude of being approached and called Coons. Well, I don't, that's why I don't call a Coon a Coon. Yes. <laughs> This is a very wrong way of approaching anybody. I mean, this is interesting. Come to me, it's not a disrespectful term to a black man. It's just a general term covering black people. You were there, you were them, you were other. You weren't a human being. You weren't somebody who, who could have emotions, have feelings. Yeah. So where were you being taught that uh, colours uh, are coons? I say when where? I'm... Is it in your police station? I was aware that things weren't good between young black boys and the police, but I only became fully conscious of it when I joined a black organisation. Black power wasn't about hating white people, it was about how you could change your life and your circumstances in this country. Myself and my three friends had been to a black power meeting in North London. We were coming home on the tube, it was an ordinary evening, but an ordinary evening was going to turn into something extraordinary. We we're going to move from one reality and be plunged into another reality. Four of us got off the train. A group of men suddenly grabbed us, started pushing and shouting and pushing and shouting. I didn't know what the heck was going on. I was held in a headlock. And when I said, what the hell are you lot doing? They said, we're police! We're police! I was handcuffed to a, a uniformed policeman. He kept saying to me, just you fucking wait till we get to the station. Just you fucking wait till we get to the station. I knew exactly what he meant. He gave me two punches in the back of my head. Hit me in the body. Immense pain. I was forced by them to admit the crimes I did not commit on the underground. I was forced to sign a false confession. Black people and the working classes were easy pickings and you could almost guarantee that any bust would be successful. Corrupt officers would take advantage if they could. 
because they were in a system whereby if you didn't get a rest, you wouldn't get promoted. You know, whether you're a uniformed officer in Yorkshire or a CID officer in London, you've got to accentuate the positive. You've got to keep on nicking people or else you don't deserve your salary. You would often go up on a selection board and the chairman of the board would say to you, how many suspected persons have you arrested this year? So it was making it clear that it was expected of you to do that. Well, I have to say, if you were going to arrest a suspected person properly and within the law, you'd have to be very, very patient. You appear to be a very efficient police officer because you're putting all these people away. This is classic corruption. The trouble with it is, as with all corruption, once you start, it's hard to stop. And that then leads into the next form of corruption, which is you start to license criminals and you start to take money. All you've got to remember is, is this, I'd say, if you can go and do something, right, you go and do it. Oh, oh, nice. Nice. See, because if we find out you've done something, then we want to fucking share, yeah, right? Continuing his corrupt career advice, Detective John Simons offers Michael Perry a deal. Round here, any time, anything you like. Anything you like. I'll have to give you a license. Simons was giving him Perry the license to commit crime. It wasn't a piece of paper, but it was the understanding that if you work with a police officer uh, as a criminal, and you did criminal acts, that he would not arrest you for those acts, uh, provided he knew you'd done them and that he was getting his whack. But then again, you might want to do something with some help. Then we can do all sorts of things. Go and turn some poor fucking booze around, but doing that. Simons is basically proposing a partnership. He's going to go into business with a villain. He will raid a pub just to eliminate anyone who may be Perry's rival or an enemy. If Perry's got a license to commit crime, then you in turn have a license to make money. You think I'll come with you? Yeah. <laughs> you can't have any better insurance neck, can you? You can't have any better insurance neck, can you? <laughs> Civil society depends on the police. I want to be able to rely on the police. But if you can't trust the police to affect the law that we've worked so hard to put in place, then the whole of civil society breaks down. By the late 60s, Society was changing pretty rapidly. I mean, this happens to be the era when, of course, I would, I'd been a student, and for whatever cause, we would go onto the streets. It could have been about CND. It could have been about apartheid. It could have been about Vietnam. We would organize a demonstration. And when the police were trying to stop the demonstration, it was the way that we were treated, which was so shocking. We were learning what our black power friends had already gone through. What was happening in the black community had been hidden from us. We've been roughly treated, and now time for us to stand up for ourselves, find out how you could change your life and your circumstances in this country. So we saw ourselves as warriors, young, gifted and black, and also rough and tough. And we were determined to try to bring about some change. We were there to challenge the authority, to make the world better. What we were finding as white middle-class youth 
was counter to everything about how commendable our police force was, the best in the world. You had these students who were educated, often from well-moneyed backgrounds, who felt they had the right to do this and the police didn't have the right to sort of stop them. Surely we can know who the people who have been arrested are. I don't think the middle classes really came much into contact with the police until the road traffic acts came in, speeding, parking. Well, you and your colleagues like to get back in the car then? And then, of course, eventually, drugs. By the late 60s, drug taking went from a subculture to a surface culture, and this is where we had the clash between the middle class's offspring, people who just believed that society was moving on, whereas the police were still stuck in a different kind of mindset. In a high crime area where drug taking might be on the increase, suspicions are easily aroused, especially by young blacks and hippie types. This time they found nothing more potent than elderberries. Have you been stopped before by police? Yeah, ever since about 68. Why is that, do you think? Just because I've got long hair. Oh, he looks like he's got drugs. Have you ever been done so, for uh, possession of drugs or anything like that? Well, I have done, yeah. They were quite happy to have working class and black people, or now these long-haired hippies, banged up in court, fitted up. Unfortunately, it began happening to the middle class and we began to be able to shift perception. Caroline Kuhn, co-founder and director of Release. In the last three years, Release has helped some 10,000 young people. From the day our release telephone was in our studio, we were surrounded by young people who were in daily conflict with the police. Organisations, including perhaps most prominently Release, were there to assist. And of course, the people who ran these organisations were, were quite politically savvy, and they knew what was going on. what the corrupt officers did, because they wanted to increase their standing within the police force, was to take drugs to a raid and then plant huge amounts of drugs on youth and then say these were dealers. One couple who fall prey to the corrupt practice of planting drugs are Simon and Georgina Hands. They were fairly well-heeled, well-educated Londoners. They were people who were not involved in any way in the drug trade. They found themselves arrested and charged with the possession of three pounds of cannabis, which simply had never been there before the raid. I mean, three pounds of cannabis at that time would have been regarded as uh, showing that they were quite serious dealers. Everybody was on the side of the police, including relations and things and friends. This sort of trust in British justice, the police were all right, really. And the shock of it all, when you're standing up in the Old Bailey and there's all this rubbish being said about you, is quite unbelievable. There you have it, baby. We had to learn all these kind of criminal languages. The police would just make up things in their statements, what we learnt to call verbaling. They would start verbaling youth. When they say they have been verbal, the police have accused them in evidence of saying something that they haven't said. So in, in essence, the police have made it up. You could go into the Old Bailey week after week and you'd see trials where they would invent verbal testaments. The most ludicrous uh, statements would be read out. I did it. I cannot deny it. It's a fair cop guff. You caught me bang to rights. I've been, been expecting, I'm glad you came because you stopped me doing something worse. You would do a whole stream of invented dialogue, well, not even dialogue. 
So in the case of Simon and Georgina Hands, middle class people, the same verbaling technique was applied. And of course, it just didn't, it didn't fit. But we were reported to have said things like, oh, wow, man, yeah, that's my dope. And I think that's hers, but we don't know about the bit under the mattress. You know, I mean, it, it was just, had it not been so horrific, one could have seen the amusing side of it. Simon and Georgina Hans are eventually acquitted of possessing three pounds of cannabis. What we had to understand as white activists was that there was a whole system of corruption that had been used to suppress not only white working class, but anybody of color. We thought we had it bad, they had it doubly bad. <laughs> Following their frame-up on the underground by a corrupt detective, Winston True and his three friends faced trial at the Old Bailey. Their charge was conspiracy to rob, conspiracy to steal, me assaulting two police officers, two counts of attempted theft, and about six counts of actual theft. Back in the 60s and 70s, the jury would have been almost entirely white, old, and in front of them, in the dock, would be a black man. And you have him up against a white detective who will be dressed impeccably, speaking to a prepared script. The victims that Winston and his friends are alleged to have robbed fail to be produced in court. We were found guilty for all the offences the police said they saw us doing at the Over Underground station that night. How could I be guilty of something I didn't do? I could not believe it. Who you thought you was before you were told you were guilty, you're no longer anymore. Winston True is sentenced to two years. You'll have to fight for a further 47 before the conviction is quashed and his name is cleared. In those days, there were lax controls. Uh, there were nobody looking for uh, corruption. It, it was allowed to go ahead. As hard as it was for us, we hoped that every so often there would be something in the press that would kind of shake up the confidence that the establishment had. But what was shocking was that nothing of this was leaking into the popular media. The terrible truth was crime reporters, by and large, were in bed with the police. Because they were paying for tip-offs day in, day out. Roy, hold yes, up yes. on page one, got a new story. If you told a story about bent cops, you might find that you wouldn't get much police cooperation or much else for quite a long while afterwards. So, it took two general news reporters who had really no experience of crime reporting to break this relationship. Julian Manta and Gary Lloyd Three weeks into the Times investigation, and still unaware that he's being recorded, John Simons continues to take money off Michael Perry. Here he comes now. He's told me to follow him round. Same place as I met him before. It gets to a point that you're a self-respecting criminal doing a bit of burglary and all that, and actually, most of your profit is going to the police. Your trade is being undermined by their greed. 
and Michael Parry had had enough. But investigating corrupt police officers from the point of view of being a journalist is one of the toughest gigs there are. So the only way they can make this work is to get police officers like John Simons to damn themselves by their own words. Don't forget, always let me know straight away if you want to because I know people everywhere. But I'm a little firm in a firm that doesn't matter where, anywhere in London. I can get on the phone to someone that I know I can trust that talks the same as me. And, and if he's not the person that can do it, well, he will know someone who can. And if he's not the person that can do it, well, he will know someone who can. Well, I'm a little firm in a firm that doesn't matter where, anywhere in London. I can get on the phone to someone that I know I can trust. This was really stunning stuff. What John Simon said was that it's not just a few rotten apples. He is telling the unvarnished truth that the Metropolitan Police is, at least in parts of the CID, a criminal organization. The firm in a firm. firm in the firm is a group of corrupt officers within Scotland Yard who operated throughout the whole of London completely out of control. They were a sinister web of corruption. You would be able to find within two or three phone calls the right person for any particular situation who could sort stuff out. There's active detectives, we all knew that such a thing existed. If you arrested a high-profile criminal, you very often got a phone call from another detective to say, can anything be done? What do you mean, can anything be done? He's asking you, can you water down the evidence? Can you accept a bribe? That's the way it would normally occur. So we were all well aware. The Metropolitan CID is not a very big organization. At that time, it had just around 3,000 members. But in the active areas, they all knew each other because there was all a process of perpetual interchange. I've got him now. It was a completely hermetic, operation, and it was rock hard. Now, you don't need a majority of police officers to be involved in a firm within a firm. You want strategically placed police officers in various departments. It was a means of allowing corruption to exist. With their secret recordings as incriminating evidence, the Times publish its account of bribery and corruption within the Metropolitan Police Force. When the Times published its story, I think most readers would have been, to use that very crude term, gobsmacked. When I first read it, which I did that Saturday, um, it was horrifying. I was absolutely devastated because I couldn't believe what was being said, that police officers would uh, go to that extent that they would be that corrupt. <laughs> That's extraordinary stuff. It is, if you, as they say, you couldn't make it up. The Times was a newspaper of record, trusted globally. 
it was very important that it was the Times. It was the voice of the establishment. It was exactly who was reading it, not how many. It would have included all parliamentarians, leading civil servants, and the great and the good in every county and city in the United Kingdom. Ten days after the Times expose, the government instigate an investigation into corruption inside the Metropolitan Police. It will be overseen by an inspector from the Home Office. My initial reaction was that the allegations were valid and correct. There was no doubt in my mind because of the nature of the presentation, because of the conversations that had taken place, and because of the whole background to the matter, I was satisfied that those allegations were correct. Frank Williamson was a very austere person. Straight coppers are not easy company. They can be dismissed as Puritans, unsociable, he wasn't the sort of person you could say, oh, come on, mate, let's go out for a drink. These very characteristics alienated the yard officers because there was no way you could get at him. He's brought down to London straight as a die, old style copper, the type that you like to think occurred in the 50s. No fear, no favour. He comes to the yard, starts to investigate. The trouble was, Frank Williamson could not himself issue charges. Uh, he would have been subordinate to the Metropolitan Police because at this point, only Metropolitan officers should investigate other Metropolitan officers. All the um, senior officers are saying, we'll help you. This is really important work you're going to do. And they assign a detective's chief superintendent called Bill Moody to him. Bill Moody was my boss, so I knew Bill Moody quite well. As a copper and a senior officer, very impressive. He was a breath of fresh air in many ways. Moody had been in the force for many years and he'd done all the necessary things to advance to a fairly high rank. Don't forget, always let me know straight away if you want to because I know people everywhere. Moody investigated with extreme enthusiasm. But more than it's not a game you've got in yours, you know. Other detectives in the force thought he was overdoing it and he did appear to be making progress. The trouble is, the Metropolitan Police, and particularly Scotland Yard, had been protected for years by the public myth of incorruptibility and will always protect itself by blocking, destroying, discrediting anything that dares to threaten it. As time goes on, Frank Williamson starts to realize that it's very odd. At every turn, he seems to be foiled. Always someone knows what he's about to do and suddenly the locker he's about to open has been emptied. The officer in charge of a major inquiry keeps an action book in order that he can detail the action that he needs taking. Such an action book was in existence in connection with this inquiry, and some days afterwards, that book disappeared and was never found again. If officers are under suspicion, then immediately everything related to their work whether it's on police premises or in their homes, should have been seized. None of this was done. Frank Williamson realizes that the officers around him 
are basically making his life difficult to make sure he gets no results. Frank could see that there was something very odd going on, that in certain areas where Bill Moody was displaying intense enthusiasm for going after possibly villainous cops, nothing ever really happened because Moody was generating heat, not light. Williamson noticed that Moody's lifestyle did not match his income as a Detective Chief Superintendent. Moody was pretty flash. He was well-heeled, he sprouted wealth. Certainly I was worried about his lifestyle. Certainly I was worried about his personal conduct and attitude. I was certainly worried about his motor cars. Moody was driving a flash car at the moment, obviously worth quite a lot of money, far more than he could have afforded on his police salary. Meantime, Frank was driving a pretty middle-of-the-road vehicle. I came onto the car park in my 1800 motor car. He flashed in beside me in his Lancia and got out and walked across to me and indicating my motor car said, is that the best you can do? And in fact, that was the best I could do. Within my knowledge, Mr. Moody entertained the whole of the inquiry team and their wives and what I heard about that party after the event indicated to me that it must have been a party which cost him a lot of money. Moody was regarded as absolutely staunch. This is a word used in the criminal fraternity too to describe someone who is, uh, who is totally loyal. You can rely on them. They will not grasp, they will not betray. Moody's whole operation is not to allow Williamson to get to other members of the firm within the firm, to keep Williamson locked down on the small amount of evidence that the Times have provided. Can I speak to Inspector Robson, please? There's nothing at the moment. Oh, but Sergeant Harris, is he back? In the end, Moody made no additional arrests. Just Robson and Harris went to jail. Because, of course, Moody is there not in reality to get to the bottom of this matter, but to bury it. Inspector Bernard Robson is jailed for seven years. Sergeant Gordon Harris gets six, both guilty of accepting bribes and perverting the course of justice. In a sense, it was quite localized. It was containable, as it were. The cancer didn't go beyond that particular pairing. However, John Simons managed to argue successfully that he would not be forced to go on trial with Robson and Harris. And what he was threatening to reveal was far more serious. If you nicked anywhere in London, mm. right, I, I can get on the blower to someone who Ooh, will know someone. Someone, someone knows someone, yeah, yeah. Who can get something done. This is in London. On no account could the bosses of Scotland Yard allow Simons to go on trial. He was going to stand up at the Old Bailey and say, it's all true, and here are the names of the officers who are involved. I spent two weeks writing down everything I knew about everybody. I knew Moody well, and I wrote down uh, quite a lot about everything else I knew. How many corrupt policemen did you mention, do you think? Well, over 100. Moody said, listen, I'm not going to let you go on trial. We will provide you with money 
to go abroad. Just get out of the country. Simons decided that the better part of valor is discretion, and he went abroad. Moody and Co. gave me money to go abroad. Gave me 2,000 pounds to go. And I was promised more, which never came. They just wanted me out of the way. When Frank Williamson had finished his time on the Times Inquiry, he was simply exhausted. He had been defeated. He may have had his suspicions as to how this happened, but I don't think he had any idea of just how bad it was. Moody had done everything required of him, and he wasn't doing this on his own initiative. Moody was there because his boss, Commander Wally Virgo, knew that this matter had to be stopped. This investigation could not be allowed to go anywhere because Virgo could see that if the spider's web, the firm in a firm, was exposed, then they would all go down together. This matter had to be sabotaged. Their whole lives depended on it. Bill Moody does his job. He contains the problem, and the firm within the firm is still open for business. Well, I'm a little firm in a firm that don't matter where, anywhere in London. I can get on the phone to someone that I know I can trust. In 1981, after nine years in hiding, John Simons returns to Britain and receives a two-year sentence for corruption. The Times revelation is truly astonishing, but people took the view that this was a real exception and it was a disgrace. They would not believe there was a firm within a firm. In the end, no great damage was done to the structure of the Metropolitan Police as far as the public were concerned. But of course, you can't stop fires breaking out everywhere. You can shut down one, but the trouble is, this could come up anywhere. If Moody thought he was home free, and the yard was clear for another generation. Nonsense. The Sunday people was about to blow up. Scotland Yard wide open with another story. This time, it really was the big time. If you wanted to operate in Soho and run a sex shop, you had to pay off the bent police. Without police help in any country, rackets can't survive. Top cop goes on holiday with top pornographer. I mean, how amazing was that? <laughs> 